Hey, welcome everybody. This is Richard Sachs. We're broadcasting live on Lost Arts Radio this Saturday, September 26th, 2015. I'm really glad you're here. We've got a pretty neat show tonight. I think you'll like it. And it has to do with um, quality of food that we're all eating, starting with the, uh, the first part of the show is about the GMO issue. And I've been following this pretty closely for a long time, quite a few years. And the public is finally getting more and more aware that if you genetically alter the food, it's deadly for the people and animals that eat it. I mean, that it's really not that complex. I, maybe, you know, there's a lot of complexities you can look at, but the issue itself to be able to figure out if it's brilliant to eat G- GMO food or not is really not too difficult. So the public's waking up to some of the, the deepest truths are, are often the simplest ones. And so communities and cities and counties and states have been um, working with their governments because the governments often just either don't care or they're paid off apparently by somebody that wants the GMOs to actually get into the food supply, which is a major crime and should never be allowed. I mean, they're, they're talking about labeling now because they think people would not buy the GMOs so much if it says genetically engineered on the package, which... I think it's probably true that's happening in Europe and it makes it much less worthwhile or not worthwhile at all for the GMO um, fake food producers to put it out and pay all their fake scientists to make believe that it's edible and that sort of thing. So the, the labeling movement has been important in that way, even though, in my opinion, it should be banned from the planet immediately. If humans still had common sense, that would be so obvious. Um, but to be realistic and have a strategy that works. The labeling movement has been a very powerful idea because as it gets labeled, um, people don't buy it so much, even if they're really not sure why. They're just suspicious, and so they tend not to buy it, the food that's labeled with GMO ingredients. And obviously, the biotech companies totally agree with that because they spend tens of millions of dollars to avoid... GMOs being labeled. So now what they're doing in addition is spending even more money to buy off the congressmen and and give them uh, fake information about how scientific GMOs are and how they're going to save the world from starvation, even though they're actually going to do the opposite. And um, it's a pretty intense fight at the moment. But what Jeffrey brings in addition to this vast experience in the whole movement and being one of the top educators about GMOs in the world, who's written some great books and um, is about to come out with a new movie. And for that, you need to go to uh, secretingredients.com and please support the finishing of this movie to get it out as fast as possible. Every day really matters now. And uh, anyway, what Jeffrey is saying that's super encouraging is that If consumers get more and more educated, which they are, and he's a big reason for it, about GMOs, and they stop buying them, then even if the biotech companies that, you know, are fine with us all getting sick and dying from eating their product, even if they win by corrupting all and paying off or threatening or whatever they do, all the senators and congressmen to vote, uh, to stop GMO labeling, which is basically what they're doing or what they're on the verge of doing. It's already been passed by the house and they're working on uh, the Senate right now. Even if that happens, Jeffrey points out that if the consumers vote with our dollars and just don't buy this stuff, then it won't matter whether it's labeled or not. You know, everybody will be buying certified organic food, which won't uh, contain GMO ingredients. And those companies will, um, not be able to continue their business. This is a really important point. So anyway, without using up any more of our time, uh, let's go and, and hear Jeffrey, and I'll I'll talk to you after that, and then we'll get into the next amazing guest that happens after that. But I've been trying to get uh, Jeffrey Smith on the phone for months, on the phone, on the show for months, and uh, we finally managed to do that. He's incredibly busy trying to work all over the country and other parts of the world to... Uh, wake people up as fast as possible so the GMOs one way or another can go away, which is the only suitable thing for them to do. So listen carefully. Please support the finishing of his movie, um, secretingredientsmovie.com. 
and he's, we've, we cover really a lot of important information on this discussion. At the very end, if it seems like he's leaving abruptly, he is, because I kept him late unknowingly. We got cut off so many times, which often happens for um, controversial subjects, and we just edit it back together, but it uses a lot more time, and I didn't realize he had an appointment to go to instantly after ours, so that was my fault. Anyway, enjoy Jeffrey Smith, and I'll talk to you right afterwards. Welcome, everybody. This is Richard Sachs, broadcasting for Lost Arts Radio, and we have a special show tonight and a a great chance to talk with a person who's been a a hero of mine for a long time, Jeffrey Smith, the founder of Institute for Responsible Technology, is one of the leading voices in the world about uh, genetically modified organisms education and teaching people what GMO food actually is and what we need to do to make sure that we're not eating it and that no one else is either. I'm really anxious to get into that discussion, but before we do, it seems like it would set the tone really well to look at, well, not look at, but listen to a three-minute trailer for a new movie coming out, and it's called Secret Ingredients, a movie that you'll definitely want to see, and uh, later on we'll direct you to the uh, URL where you can actually see the video version of this really great trailer, and I would recommend that you do that right after the show as well. So let's at least listen to the audio, and then we'll get on to our our visit with Jeffrey Smith. So at the time that I was doing triathlons and living a healthy lifestyle, I met my husband. He also was very dedicated to healthy living. And we got married and started our family. So we had children and a brand new house. And we both had careers that we loved. And we were both active and physical. And that all came to a screeching halt in... (laughs) In August of 2007. I mean, after all, it's a poison. The biggest fraud in the history of science. And we are the guinea pigs. We had 21 chronic diseases in one family. I have had um, three miscarriages. I've seen a rapid decline in children's health in the past 10 to 15 years. We had to rent the nebulizer so often from the pediatrician that she suggested we buy our own. My daughter was about eight years old and she was huffy and she was starting to develop breasts. His body was covered in rashes, head to toe, behind the knees, was so inflamed he was bleeding. Kids who can't control themselves, kids who can't transition, kids who can't focus, kids who can't sleep. A well-respected neurologist said that he would never speak and that he would never have peer relationships or social experiences, potentially not live on his own, never get married. Why is a chemical company in charge of the food? So many diseases and disorders have skyrocketed since the introduction of GMOs and Roundup in the food supply in the mid-1990s. Asthma, allergies, autism, ADHD, anxiety, autoimmune disease, and that's just the AIDS. I've removed genetically modified food and had kids eat all organic food. No pesticides, no GMOs. And the changes I've seen are remarkable. So we went from, you know, your son has autism, your daughter has asthma, to no, they don't. Her belly is completely flattened out and she's stopped that accelerated development. You know, she is where I feel like she belongs as an 11 year old little girl. Stephen now is an articulate, lovely, straight-A student with many friends, active, plays sports. He participates in a mainstream classroom without any supports, no speech therapy, no articulation disorder, no physical therapy, no occupational therapy. He does all the things other children do with great ease and elegance and grace, and he is perfect. I am 22 weeks pregnant, and I feel fantastic. This shift can only come by a global desire to change our food supply. The removal of genetically modified foods, glyphosate, and pesticides was the fundamental, the foundation for why we all recovered. Our families have been told a lie. So this is a pretty intense emotional 
trailer that we just heard the audio from, and I think a couple of important points for, from it are, are, first of all, the understanding that none of us should be eating GMO ingredients in any of our food, but the other is to make it very clear that this is not just an intellectual scientific issue. This is highly personal. It has an emotional impact on every aspect of our lives, and everyone ha has a stake in this who eats food from the American food supply. So we have a lot to talk about, and it directly impacts every member of your family, and that's that's what we're going to get into. So welcome, Jeffrey. I'm, I'm really pleased that you had the time to spend with us tonight. It's going to be a Sure. Good Thank you very much. And I wanted to say that if people want to see the visual, visuals of the trailer... Uh, it's at secretingredientsmovie.com. The name of the movie, which is under production, and we're actually I'm the uh, co-producer and co-editor with my partner Amy Hart. We're actually raising funds now to finish it. We've gotten through most of the shooting, and we're well underway into the editing. So we're on a crowdfunding program, and at secretingredientsmovie.com, you can watch the trailer, make a donation, and learn more about the film. And it came um, it came about interesting. In an interesting way, um, my earlier film, Genetic Roulette, which was seen by millions of people around the world, it was played on PBS over 300 times, um, it created a wave of people avoiding GMOs um, because it makes it absolutely clear all these diseases are linked to GMOs and so, many, so much evidence demonstrates that, that people were jumping off of the GMO bandwagon by, you know, by tens of thousands. And we were hearing so many testimonials of people who were getting better after quickly eliminating GMOs from their diet after seeing the movie. And so we actually found this one family who was the sort of the center point of this new film where they had 21 chronic conditions between the five members of the family. And the mother, they had, the son was autistic, the mother was permanently disabled, the father had a breast tumor, there was... Uh, eczema and asthma and all these other disease disorders in the family and she began to study nutrition and started to experiment with the family with their food when the medical model ran out of what it could offer and she got rid of gluten and she got rid of commercial dairy and whatnot and she noticed some improvements but when she learned about GMOs and pesticides and switched to an organic diet that's when all of the conditions rapidly improved in fact went away and so we have her family and we have others and we have doctors and scientists and survey results and, and research studies all making this point that there's more than 20 chronic illnesses in the United States on the rise that are clearly linked to GMOs. And we've heard so much evidence to that we're convinced that their increase in the U.S. Um, population because of, since GMOs were introduced – is related. Right. Uh, it, it seems like at this point there's just no doubt at, at all that GMOs are basically inedible for anybody that doesn't want negative results. And I, I think in the interest of trying to bring in people to this discussion who may not have the background and are just finding out or trying to find out what GMOs actually are, can we do a little bit of review of what that is and then if they're really so bad how in the world is it that they're being allowed in the food supply when people are trusting these agencies? We have the FDA and um, USDA and all these agencies that have promised to make sure that nothing unsafe gets in the food supply. But I'd like to start with what they actually are so everyone's up to speed. Well, with genetic engineering, you can swap genes between species. So you could take a gene from a spider and put it into a goat in the hopes that you can milk the goat to get spiderweb protein to make bulletproof vests. I'm not making this up. This was actually done, and it was not successful. Um, you could put human genes into corn to make a spermicide. They've done that. They can mix and match across species, across kingdoms, and that way they can create completely new organisms that were not part of the billions of years of evolution, but they can create them you know, in an instant. Uh, in addition to that, the process of genetic engineering itself, of you know, the insertion process, plus in the case of plants, cloning the cell into a plant, creates massive collateral damage in the DNA of that plant. And so at the end of the day, if you start with a natural corn plant, for example, and then you 
equip it with a pesticide gene in every cell, you not only have a gene-sized spray bottle in every cell of the plant, you also end up with 2 to 4% of that DNA different, and that's mostly mutations, which can be hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. And like in the case of Monsanto's corn, you have a new allergen that's never been in corn before. In the case of their soy, you have seven times the amount of the normal uh, existing soy allergen that's found in normal soy. You can have toxins. You can have nutritional problems. You can have carcinogens uh, turned on. So it's like, uh, this is one reason why I called my first movie, my, my recent movie, Genetic Roulette, because you're really spinning the wheel and wondering what you're going to get when you do this genetic engineering process. Now, these side effects were not lost on the FDA scientists who were asked to evaluate the technology back in the early 90s. Uh, they tapped a group of scientists at the agency and said, can you please evaluate GMOs so we can create a policy from your evaluation? Unfortunately, they did not base the policy on the evaluation. The evaluation by the scientists pointed out that GMOs were different and dangerous and could lead, as we said, to allergens, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. And they urged their superiors to require long-term safety studies, including human studies, on every single GMO introduced. But the White House had instructed the leadership of the FDA to promote GMOs. And so they recruited Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, to take a new position designed specifically for him, the Deputy Commissioner of Policy. And as the Deputy Commissioner of Policy, he was in charge of determining and setting forth the policy on GMOs. And when the scientists wrote their suggestions and passed it on to the upper management, essentially Michael Taylor, then every time they got a new draft back, more and more of their concerns were removed systematically until eventually one scientist complained that there was no science in the policy whatsoever, that it was a pro-industry document that ignored the side effects, and uh, he predicted that if you're not going to be requiring any safety studies, which is ultimately what they did, then even the basic safety studies would not be done, which is also true. So we have a situation where the FDA, basically captured by Monsanto, allows Monsanto itself to determine whether its own GMOs are safe, and Monsanto could put it on the market without even telling the FDA or consumers. Michael Taylor then, went, then after leaving the FDA, became Monsanto's vice president, and now he's back at the FDA and the Obama administration as their food safety czar. So we don't have an independent organization in the government that is protecting our health, we have an enforcement wing of the biotech industry, and that's not only reflected in Michael Taylor's tenure at the agency, but also people at the USDA and at the EPA and in other places, and, and also even the State Department. If you look at the WikiLeaks, the State Department is deployed as a marketing arm of the biotech industry. Wow. So, so initially when Michael Taylor was in the FDA the first time and in that position that you said was so critical to... Uh, the policy formation. How did he get in that position originally? Actually, it was his second time. First, he was as part of the FDA. Then he moved to King and Spalding Law Firm, and his clients included Monsanto, as well as a biotechnology council. Now, for the council at Monsanto, he was tapped to design a regulatory framework that would be the most friendly for the introduction of GMOs. So he created a hypothetical framework that would just wave GMOs onto the market. And then when the Bush, first Bush administration told the FDA to promote GMOs, I don't know how they were told, but they were basically picked him for this new position at probably at the urgency of the biotech industry so that he could basically implement the regulatory framework that he had designed for the industry to make it law in the United States. He also oversaw policy at the time that Monsanto's bovine growth hormone was being considered. And this is an interesting story. Uh, I talked to three Monsanto scientists. I know I talked to one Monsanto scientist whose three colleagues had done safety studies of the milk from cows treated with the company's bovine growth hormone. 
and they saw so much cancer-promoting hormone in the milk from treated cows, these three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. Now, even though it was clear to them, Michael Taylor approved bovine growth hormone. But it wasn't just him. Uh, a, a researcher from Monsanto who did research on bovine growth hormone for the company then was put in charge of a division at the FDA that reviewed her own research. Another contractor that was working on RBGH for Monsanto became the FDA's chief reviewer. And there was also a veterinarian who was alarmed at the fact that they were going to be putting RBGH in the market with so few safety studies. He started ordering more tests, and he was fired because he was holding up the approval process. When he sued in the court case, it became clear and was admitted that it, he was set up to be kicked out. The FDA was forced to take him back in, but he was not put on anything related to cows, which were his specialty. He was put on chickens and basically eliminated from, you know, contributing anything meaningful from to the agency because he had been a whistleblower. So it was another example of how the agency was skewed in the direction of supporting industry at the expense of public health. You know, I, I think one of the things that's, that may be hardest for normal average people to, to comprehend and accept is that obviously these scientists were smart enough to know something about the harm that was going to come from these policies and that was fine with them they went ahead and did it anyway and I think that's really hard for most people to to grasp that there are people in power positions that that apparently have no concern about what damage is done by their policies you know it's interesting I've talked to uh, scientists on both sides of that equation uh, we know that at the time that the tobacco industry knew that uh, nicotine was addictive uh, their CEOs and scientists claim the opposite. Um, we have um, an example from a former salesperson for Monsanto, uh, Kirk Azevedo. He was recruited by, and he decided to take a position in the company because he read the glowing words of Robert Shapiro, who described the fact that GMOs could can clean up factory wastes and, and clean up all these things and turn fields into factories, etc. And so during his company orientation, he uh, got up and told his other uh, new recruits how excited he was and repeated the words of Robert Shapiro. A vice president pulled him aside after the meeting and said, wait a minute, what Robert Shapiro says is one thing. He was the CEO of Monsanto. What he says is one thing. What we do is something else. He's the front man that tells the story, but we don't even know what he's talking about. We're here to make money. Right. And then later, Kirk learned about the fact that there were some new proteins being produced in the genetically modified products that he was supposed to sell. He knew that these proteins could be very dangerous to the animals and eventually to humans. He tried to raise the issue inside the company and was ostracized. He said no one would pay attention. He tried to blow the whistle by going to ag commissioners and university professors in California, and no one paid any attention, and so he left the company saying he wasn't going to be part of that disaster. And I've also heard from other scientists, one, one scientist I just happened to have lunch with from Monsanto, and I asked him, I said, what if you're disrupting the DNA in a way that you don't even have to have, have a way to evaluate yet? And I painted a real, a real clear picture that was certainly plausible where he was causing serious harm in the population from what he didn't know about DNA, and he simply could not answer. And they came back after two minutes of silence and said, but you know, we need GMOs to feed the world. Yeah. And I knew, his, I knew that that was his justification in his mind to risking these lives. And another scientist from Monsanto also told me the same thing when I said, you can't guarantee that these foods aren't going to create allergic reactions, which might eventually kill people. And he said, but we need GMOs because I've been to India and I've seen their agriculture and we need to get them GMOs. Well, that was before they had deployed GMOs in India. It turns out there's been about 250,000 farmer suicides in India from farmers that planted the genetically engineered cotton seeds and fail, it failed so miserably they were at risk of losing their land by the loan sharks that were going to basically take their land because they couldn't get paid back 
and so they committed suicide to keep the land and the family and protect them from the shame of losing their land. An absolute genocide. And so this is what we get when we allow Monsanto, unfortunately, to come into this developed, developing country with their unreliable GMOs. You know, I, I never really understood clearly what, how what you just said would happen. The suicides would keep the land from being repossessed. How does that work? Well, they get some kind of payment for, in some cases it did, in some cases it didn't. Uh, the farmers would get some, the, the survivors would get the payment from the government when there was a suicide from okay, the farmers. So something like a life insurance deal, basically. Yeah, sort of, yeah, right. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. I thought, why would all these farmers just want to leave their families helpless with them gone? And what you just said explains it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a tragedy. And the biotech industry has so many myths that they propagate. And one of the myths is that the suicide has nothing to do with GMOs, even though surveys going door to door in the cotton growing regions have verified that 80 to 90 percent of the suicides are BT cotton related. BT is a certain type of GMO where the crop produces its own insecticide that breaks open the stomach of insects to kill them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it was also found to break open holes in human cells in, uh, in a research study, so it might be causing leaky gut in humans at the same time. Right, which makes complete sense. So, you know, the other thing that you just mentioned is that a lot of these scientists, or you would assume a lot of the scientists working for Monsanto or working in USDA to support them or, you know, part of this massive structure have these justifications running psychologically in their own minds that what they're actually doing is saving the world. But the ones at the top of the company probably know better than that. Absolutely. In fact, the, the world's leading report on how to save, how to feed the world, the ISTAD report with more than 400 scientists, concluded that GMOs have nothing to offer feeding the hungry world, eradicating poverty, or creating sustainable agriculture, and rejected it outright. Uh, the head of Syngenta, talked about how uh, natural selective breeding always wins hands down over genetic engineering with these more complex traits like salt tolerance and drought tolerance and increased yield. So they know that the feed the world exercise is just a public relations scam, uh, but not everyone working for the, for the company knows that. But we also have these, um, I've, I've identified certain uh, scientists who are, Basically, they don't care about facts at all, and they'll lie blatantly. And one was caught by the New York Times uh, just about three weeks ago, uh, Kevin Falta, who has been saying for uh, years he gets no money from Monsanto. All of his criticisms of, uh, of those of us who are con concerned about GMOs are completely independently motivated. Turns out because of a Freedom of Information Act, we found out that – or this, this – the New York Times found out that he was paid $25,000 to be a promoter of GMOs in Monsanto, and he lied about that, even as a test as testifying before boards in states, pretending that he was completely independent. But it would also implicate implicated Nina Fedorov, who was the um, science advisor to Hillary Clinton and to Condoleezza Rice, and was the head of the American Academy for Advancement of Science. It implicated her as part of this cabal of people producing these talking points. It implicated people at Cornell University and University of Mississippi. It uh, implicated uh, a guy who writes at Forbes as a, as a blogger there. All these people who we knew for years were part of this talking point echo chamber. It all came out in this article. But then, unfortunately, the writer decided to focus on these low-level people like uh, Bruce Chassie and, and – um, Kevin Fulta, and ignored the Nina Fedorov uh, uh, stature, because she is one of the like, highest-ranking members of this cabal, as well as the universities that get a lot of money from the biotech industry that participate in these talking points that are not true, but are echoed at high volumes to protect the fortunes of the biotech industry. Right. So basically, we have a subset of people that is willing to say anything to further the agenda, whether it's true or not being irrelevant. And we have another subset of people that intersects with that one that want to be in positions of control over others. Yeah, we have the, we, again, I call them the liars and the lied to. Now, it's sometimes hard to, to tell which is which. For example, 
uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson came out was interviewed and said, "Oh, GMOs are just like what we've been doing for centuries." And I and that came out on YouTube. And I wrote a, I, I videotaped a YouTube response explaining, "No, Neil, that's actually not true." The FDA scientist that reviewed GMOs said that GMOs are different and lead to different risks. And trying to force the conclusion that GMOs are the same is like trying to force a square peg into a round hole. They were responding to Michael Taylor's policy, which falsely claimed that the agency wasn't aware of information showing that GMOs were significantly different. And that was the basis of the policy saying no, G no testing was necessary, no labeling was necessary. But it was a lie. It was exactly the opposite of the scientific opinion of those experts at the agency. But it became, that lie became national policy, and it's echoed even in the false understanding of scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's well known, but obviously misinformed. So is the way the system is set up now in the agencies and in the private corporations such that honest people with good motivations are not going to get into those positions of power to straighten things out there? So far, that's the case. Um, the head of the USDA, uh, Secretary Vilsack, was the Biotech Governor of the Year in Iowa. The head of USAID was a you know, GMO cheerleader. The person that um, negotiates international trade deals for the U.S. for agriculture there was a lobbyist for the biotech industry. Um, there's so many. I mean, there's a long, long list. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, the government, it's hard to know where the government ends and GMO industry people begin. So there's a marriage there in that particular industry. And uh, it's interesting that under Clinton, Secretary Glickman, uh, Dan Glickman said that what I saw uh, generically from the probiotic side was the attitude that the technology was good and that it was immoral to say that it wasn't good because it was going to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. And if you're against it, you're Luddites. And he said that basically was the side our government was on. You felt like you were an alien or disloyal by trying to present an open-minded view. That's a quote. Now, he also said that when he... Did, and it was, it was written into his speeches. The whole pro-GMO dialogue was written into his speeches. And when he diverted from that, improvised, and raised questions about the technology, he said he got slapped around by not only the people in the Clinton administration, but by industry, and believed he was going to lose his job until Hillary mentioned to him that she liked his speech. And then he knew he maintained a job. But Hillary, it turns out, she one person that runs her campaign was a Monsanto attorney. She had a uh, fundraiser in, in that attorney's office. She's spoken before the biotech industry organization saying that GMO is basically cheerleading for GMOs. So it turns out she's pro-GMO and also probably misinformed. So it's hard to, you know, like you say, it's hard to get people who are uh, open-minded and informed in any position of uh, responsibility given the way that they're insulated at that top and basically pummeled with this talking point echo chamber right and you know you would certainly hope that their positions are because they're misinformed but there's also the possibility that they're fully informed and they're in favor of it anyway it's true and I've heard various people talk about GMOs that they've heard from government bodies about GMOs as a method for exerting power over developing countries etc it makes sense. I mean, if you own the seeds, you own the food, and if you own the food, you can control the people. A lot of people talk about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it appears that the 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 security side of the U.S. may be in favor of GMOs uh, if they can control them. But what happened is, it's interesting. The open the open gate policy for GMOs may have backfired already because we have no requirements to test for the safety of imported GMOs from other countries. Mm -hmm. So there's rumors that China is producing genetically modified uh, crops that we're importing. We don't even know which ones they are. And we don't know what they're genetically modified to do. We don't know if they've been tested for safety or if they're even purposely a problem. Uh, you can theoretically genetically modify things now to have impact on human behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly they did that years ago when they genetically engineered tobacco plants grew them illegally in Brazil, smuggled them into the United States, put one highly addictive cigarette into each of the packs in the U.S. illegally to get people more addicted. So they used genetic engineering to 
uh, increase the addictive behavior of tobacco, and they could do things like that with, with you know, with food and uh, etc. So it's a very very dangerous technology given what its what its capacity is. It's at the infant stages. The number one effect of GMOs are surprise side effects, and the regulation is almost non-existent. Right. And now, one thing I think they've been well proven to be very effective at and successful is um, if anybody happened to be interested in uh, radical population reduction in the fairly near term, the third generation of rats that I was looking at um, was completely... Hamster, it was actually hamsters. Hamsters, I'm sorry. They were completely unable to have babies. Is that right? Well, what happened is this. We've seen a number of studies that affect fertility. Uh, we've seen them in mice and rats and hamsters. The one you're referring to is a not yet published study by a researcher at the National Academy of Sciences in Russia, and they fed hamsters GM soy for three generations, and by the third generation, most ha were not able to get pregnant. Uh, the hamsters died at four or five times the rate of infant mortality compared to the controls, and many had hair growing in their mouths. Mm -hmm. Now, I spoke with the author of the study by email several times, and one of the things that's holding him up, he really wants to identify what the cause is for these problems. And here we're going to introduce another topic to the listeners if they don't already know it. The major reason they genetically engineer crops is to spray those crops with Roundup herbicide. Mm -hmm. Roundup is Monsanto's herbicide, and Roundup Ready crops are their seeds. So if someone buys a Roundup Ready seed, then they can grow that and spray it with Monsanto's Roundup herbicide. And so 80% or so of the crops out there are Roundup Ready, and you end up spraying the crops with Roundup. It gets absorbed into the crop. You can't wash it off. You eat it, and it is linked to cancer. It's been declared a probable human carcinogen by the World Health Organization. It's linked to massive birth defects in areas where there's high levels of Roundup or its active ingredient glyphosate, which is mostly what we're talking about, glyphosate. Okay. It's linked to an endocrine-disrupting uh, properties. It's an antibiotic, which means it can mess up the gut bacteria balance, killing off the lactobacillus and the bifidus and the stuff we pay for and allowing an overgrowth of the pathogenic bacteria. It damages the mitochondria. It can mess up the hormonal balance. It can the balance of neurotransmitters like serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine. It can result potentially in the reduction in vitamin D and the inability of the liver to detoxify. And it can it can take minerals out of circulation in the body and tie them up so that they're not able to be used by the body for key functions. So it's also linked to messing up the balance between estrogen and testosterone, and it's also Roundup Ready soy, for example, has been shown to damage the young sperm cells and to damage the testicles and to damage the uterus and ovaries and hormonal cycles of rats and mice. So he, this, this scientist is trying to figure out whether this this impact on the third generation of hamsters is from the Roundup or it's from the Roundup Ready crops. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there was another study that was done uh, a couple, three years ago where they took Roundup Ready corn and fed it to rats over two years, and the rats had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage compared to controls. But they also wanted to know whether it was the Roundup or the corn, and so they had two other experimental groups. They had a group that just ate the corn, the Roundup Ready corn, that had never been sprayed with Roundup, and that group also had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. But then they had another group of rats, actually several, that ate, that had no GM corn, just natural corn, but they had Roundup spiked into their drinking water wow. at very, very, in some cases, very small levels. And they also had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. So it turns out they found out that it was both the Roundup and the corn that caused the problem. Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty conclusive. So, so the man with the hamsters doesn't really have to worry about the confusion anymore. The answer <laughs> is known. Right? I actually really wanted him to publish what he had, even if he didn't have the causative pathway, but he was holding out.
Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So, I mean, if people can kind of jar themselves awake to look at this without the, um, what do I want to say, the like the familiarity that that makes them, what is it called, a normalcy bias, right? That things can't be that strange as what you're just really describing. Wow, I haven't heard that since I took statistics in graduate school. Yeah, yeah. so it's like um, there, there's a tendency to want to believe that the government is protecting us. There's a tendency to want to believe that companies can't be that dismissive of health dangers. Um, but uh, in a in recent interviews, there was an interview with Doctor or with Anthony Samson, a scientist, and. He was given by the EPA 15 to 20,000 sealed documents uh, that they had received from Monsanto on safety studies. And they somehow were able to get the EPA to seal those documents so no one else saw it, but he was able to get it. And he said they knew, they knew that there was cancer to all these different organs, bioaccumulation in all these different organs, uh, low dose effects on all these different organs. And yet they, they continued to uphold the lies of the company that none of it was true, even though they had the proof that it was true. Mm -hmm. And I was just talking to Anthony yesterday and listening to one of his, his interviews, and um, it was clear that uh, uh, the industry knew, the government knew, and yet they hid the evidence. So how much of the success of biotech companies, uh, notably Monsanto, but also Syngenta and Bayer and all the other ones that work with them. How much of that success do you think is due to and perhaps dependent on, to some degree, government cooperation with everything they want to do? It's 100 percent, because the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in the United States is a very strong law, one of the strongest in the world, to protect the safety of food. And it requires that any time there's an additive, a food additive, that it be tested and labeled as such. And there's only one way that an additive is not allowed, that it would be able to be exempt from these requirements, as far as I know, and that is if it becomes, quote, generally recognized as safe. Now, in order to be generally recognized as safe, there's two criteria. And one is that it has to have plenty of peer-reviewed published studies, or the equivalent, and overwhelming scientific consensus of safety. Now, when GMOs were introduced, the FDA did something that many consider to be illegal. They said, we will give the companies themselves the ability to determine whether their foods are generally recognized as safe, hmm. even though it had no history of peer-reviewed published studies, and it had no consensus of safety, even the scientists working at the FDA said GMOs were different and dangerous and needed to be tested. So they violated the law in order to pave the way for GMOs to be introduced, according to experts in the law, and that is why GMOs are on our plate, because of industry manipulation and political collusion. And then if I, I've traveled to 42 countries speaking about GMOs in the last 19 years, and I speak to some governments elsewhere, and they said, well, we don't have to worry about GMOs because the FDA approved it. Well, the FDA doesn't approve GMOs. They let the companies themselves determine if the foods are safe. And then if you look at the FDA, if you look at Monsanto, as, I, if you, as we see before, even the scientists working there won't necessarily consume their products because they consider them unsafe. Right. Um, so now this, this policy decision to let the company itself decide if it's generally recognized it's safe, which is really pretty incredible and, and you know if you don't know this kind of thing is going on I'm assuming that that is certainly selectively applied if I had a small organic food company they would not let me decide if my food was safe to sell on the market right well um, if it's the thing is this what's different about that I mean you could you could grow uh, broccoli and sell it on the market and if you wanted to be organic then you have to be certified and tested or, or not tested but inspected but what's interesting is that it's not normal. If it's genetically engineered, it's not the natural normal broccoli. Now, fortunately, broccoli is not genetically engineered. There's only nine GM food crops, and I'll name them because some of your people are already nervous and wondering what they can eat and what they can't eat. So let me yes. make sure that that's clear. There's soy and corn, which are in most everything. So all the derivatives of soy and corn are GMO, except 
if it says non-GMO or organic, and popcorn is not GMO. Mm. Uh, so your corn syrup, corn, you know, maltodextrin, dextrose, things that may come from corn, or we genetically engineered if, if produced in the in North America. You have canola oil and cottonseed oil. You have sugar from sugar beets. Now, most people don't realize that most sugar in the United States is from sugar beets, and as well as cane sugar, but most is sugar beet sugar. So if it says sugar on the on the uh, ingredient panel, it's a combination. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also alfalfa, which is used as animal hay. There's papaya from Hawaii or China, and there's some zucchini and yellow squash. Next year, they want to introduce apples and potatoes. So those are the only nine crops currently on the market, plus the apple-potato combination for next year. There's no other GMOs. The, the seedless watermelon's not there. There's no more tomatoes on the market. They were taken off um, 18 years ago. Um, there's no potatoes currently on the market. The old stock of potatoes uh, was taken off the market in 2001. Um, but these soy corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, papaya, zucchini, and yellow squash are the nine GMOs. Now, what's different about the law is that if you create a genetically modified papaya, you can put it on the market without even telling the FDA or telling consumers by labeling it. And that, we think, is a violation of the law because it would be considered a food additive and the food additive and they, they've basically exempted it from food additive status. Okay. So, you know, one thing that complicates this situation is that it's like this creeping amount of illegality in government that's being accepted more and more and it's it's now it's no longer is it legal or not for the government to do this is is more like is this the usual baseline illegal behavior that we can't do anything about or it's similar it's, it's similar to what uh, dr uh, lewis pribble said who was a microbiologist at the fda who was concerned about the gmo policy he said that one of the problems with the policy is that over the over time people will think, well, it's been done hundreds or thousands of times already, so it must be safe. Right. So there'll be, there'll be a kind of a, um, in the same way that there's the pile on the illegality, there's the pile on of the assumption that it must be safe because everyone's doing it, it's been on the market, etc. Yes. And, and at the same time, there is the effort to block the, pub, the publications of independent research and then once things are publicized or published, then to attack, distort, and deny the evidence. And this is something that we found common since uh, the mid-1990s. Uh, when scientists discover problems, they're fired, stripped of responsibilities, mm -hmm. denied tenure, denied funding, threatened, all these things. And it's, it's been repeated so often, it was even described in the journal Nature as the common result of a knee-jerk reaction to any time someone discovers a problem. And so this has been a strong disincentive for scientists to take up research in this area, so strong that literally hundreds of scientists who would have done research in this area refuse to. And if they do want to do research, they can't get access to the seeds because they're patented. They can't get access to money. They can't get things published. And if they do get published, then their entire career is under threat. So it's a very well-oiled machine that is delivering dangerous products into our food supply. And all of this is very well documented. My book, Seeds of Deception, was written in 2003, mm -hmm. and it describes many of these things that happened before then. Um, there's a book out by Stephen Drucker called Altered Genes, Twisted Truth. that came out this year, describes things that for the last 30 years. It's really well documented, and it's not a conspiracy theory. It is history. Right, and the reason I asked you how much of it depends on the total cooperation between the government, which now is literally a web of corporations itself, and the private corporations is because, I mean, I know this is kind of old-fashioned to think that the Constitution is still in force, but theoretically it's still the law of the land for the federal government's restrictions. And as far as I remember, there's a clause in there called the Enumerated Powers Clause, and according to it, the government's not allowed to operate in agriculture at all. Well, I wasn't aware of that. But now we have a situation where the DARK Act, which we call DARK because it's D-A-R-K, denying Americans the right to know, mm -hmm. um, makes it illegal for states to pass laws requiring labeling of GMOs. Now, this was passed in the Congress, but not the Senate. So it was the House, not the Senate. 
Um, and the Senate will take it up soon. And so we encourage people to call senators with the information about the Dark Act, which they can simply Google online and, and urge them not to vote in favor of the Dark Act. Yeah. Uh, but right now, like Vermont passed a, a, a law requiring labeling, and if this Dark Act passes, then that becomes null and void. Um, there's many other states that are going to be passing labeling requirements, we believe, soon, unless this Dark Act passes. So that actually does the opposite of what you said. It This allows states and any jurisdictions below state level to um, pass laws related to GMOs and agriculture. So it will nullify 43 existing laws that aren't necessarily labeling, but other laws. So it's really preempting states' rights and local rights. Yeah. And then there's these treaties, the, the Transatlantic or the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then the TTIP for Europe. They also could, if they're passed, they could result in foreign powers, foreign governments, or even foreign companies suing our government, saying that these laws are illegal because they're preventing us to have profits in your country. And so it's a way of preempting even federal law. So right. the so these corporations have layers of influence moving up the chain from local to state to federal to international. Right, and, and it seems to me that, I mean, I don't know if you know about this or not, but it seems to me that Congress cannot ratify a treaty that's unconstitutional. You know, it's a very interesting thing. I was talking to someone who had experience arguing things before the Supreme Court, and he pointed out the same thing. Now, we're dealing with a situation in Hawaii where their state constitution allows for, first of all, rights to the land, to nature. Mm -hmm. um, so because that was one of the conditions of the takeover of the, you know, from the colonization of Hawaii, was the, the land, or what they call aina, is extremely important. They also, in Hawaii, gave the people the right to vote directly on, on things that would overturn state laws produced by the, by the legislature. This was discovered by some friends of mine who then created the first and only ballot initiative using that particular law, um, uh, and they won a, a vote um, where it basically would have caused Monsanto to stop doing business in the county of Maui because they couldn't prove that their crops and associated agricultural chemicals were safe. So it was going to stop them until they were able to prove that it was safe. But the government in Hawaii, in Maui, was in collusion with the industry. And so they pretended to sue each other. And then it went to a uh, judge who was also apparently on side with the industry. Mm -hmm. And they nullified the election. <laughs> so, so the industry, in conjunction with the executive branch, in conjunction with the court system, nullified a constitutional provision, and that's under appeal right now, and we hope that the, the appeals court will then nullify the effects of their, their other the judge that, that basically ignored the will of the people and ignored the Constitution. But it's that, it's that kind of insidiousness, it's that kind of, of uh, penetrated uh, influence. Uh, Clarence Thomas, who's in the uh, Supreme Court, used to be a Monsanto lawyer, and when there was a ruling that was in favor of Monsanto, he wrote the majority position and never recused himself. Uh, there was another judge that was, uh, it was interesting, a friend of mine was suing Monsanto and trying to get class action status. He got overturned by a judge, and the New York Times wrote about it and said, unbeknownst to anyone, this judge used to be the lawyer of record for Monsanto, never announced and never recused himself. So we have all these three branches of government that are in the pockets and uh, what I feel is that we actually, in spite of that, have a victory that's pending very soon. Because we can win the entire battle of GMOs without any policy change. We can win the battle of GMOs simply by turning GMO ingredients into a marketing liability. This is what we call a tipping point. This is what happened in Europe in 1999. When Unilever on April 27th, followed by Nestle's the next day, followed by the rest of the food industry soon after, committed to stop using GM ingredients. Because there, the press was covering the health dangers, was covering a major GMO food safety scandal, which I write about in my books and my movies. And um, that was covered there, but not here. And so people were agitated. They were concerned about GMOs. It's been kicked out of Europe 
since 1999. Bovine growth hormone was kicked out of most American dairies uh, nine or seven to nine years ago. Uh, GMOs were kicked out of the natural products industry two years ago. Each of these were tipping points based on market forces, based on people educated about the health dangers of GMOs or bovine growth hormone. So now we are educating people, and this is why the film Secret Ingredients is so important. This is why we want to get it out to millions of people. Because if, if normal consumers, especially moms trying to protect their kids, mm-hmm. realize how dangerous GMOs are and start choosing the non-GMO label products in Safeway, in Publix, etc., and there's more and more of those, and those groups start increasing in market share, then we end up with a tipping point when the food company realizes that using GM ingredients has become a marketing liability. And that's what we're working at at the Institute for Responsible Technology at responsibletechnology.org. So people are welcome to go there and sign up to become part of the Tipping Point Network, sign up for our free newsletter, sign up to become a speak to learn how to speak on GMOs, etc. A lot of a lot of good material is there, a lot of good opportunities are there, and I say we are actually winning the fight. And we see the early signs of a tipping point in conventional food industry on the horizon. So will this, will, will everything that you just said apply if it becomes illegal to do the labeling? Yes. Okay. You see, it would becomes, where, where it would become a problem is if it became illegal for voluntarily non-labeling something non-GMO. You see, we got rid of bovine growth hormone without requiring labels saying that products are, are are from cows treated with bovine growth hormone because so many dairies were announcing voluntarily on their label that it was made without the hormone. Right, right. Now we have over 32,000 products that are verified non-GMO, boasting on their packaging that they're non-GMO, and we have Cheerios and grape nuts, and I can't believe it's not butter and Smart Balance and soon Hershey's and, and also a new Similac brand, all declaring non-GMO, and that could provide the difference needed for consumers to drive the tipping point. Okay, so as long as they leave it uh, legal to voluntarily state that there are no GMOs, then that whole strategy can work. Yes. Right. And and the organic option is there too. And as long as the standards specify that it can't have GMO ingredients, then that's another additional benefit, right? I mean, people can choose organic food. In fact, choosing organic is more important these days than ever before because Roundup, which is certainly one of the reasons why GMOs are so dangerous, it's also sprayed on non-GMO crops as a ripening agent just before harvest, including wheat, rye, barley, oats, rice, also potatoes, sweet potatoes, citrus crops, uh, I'm told almond almond, uh, orchards. It's sprayed a lot in agriculture. It's in a lot of our food but it's not used in, in organic agriculture. So we say buy organic as the priority, and if you can't buy organic, at least buy non-GMO. Okay, all right. And, the, and this should be a, a market force to get more, more farmers into organic farming as well, right? Yes, absolutely. And you can find out which products are GMO or non-GMO by going to non-GMOshoppingguide.com. There you have the 32,000 products listed. Um, and also the hidden ingredients, the derivatives of soy and corn, which you wouldn't necessarily know, are genetically engineered. Okay, great. Is that on the same site? Yeah. All right, all right, excellent. So um, you're kind of playing down a little bit the critical nature of uh, this dark act because it, it doesn't undermine the strategy that you just described. Well, what it does, I mean, here's the thing. If If... GMOs were labeled as such. 57 or 8 percent of Americans say they would avoid GMOs if they were labeled. Okay. Now that would be, in my mind, a if it takes 18 months, for example, for the food companies to implement uh, labeling. I think in those 18 months they would get rid of GMOs rather than admit that they're using. Them. Mm-hmm. So I think it would accelerate the tipping point dramatically. They don't want that. So. The biotech industry and the food companies have spent over $100 million fighting uh, ballot initiatives in four states, uh, trying to deny Americans the right to know. Now they've spent uh, tens of millions in, in lobbying Congress to try and do it all at once. They're going to have to fight these laws, fight these um, votes state by state. Um, it, is, it, it is a tragedy if it passes, but it's not the end game. Okay. Because, in fact, 
we, we do, ex I, I personally, when I started with GMOs 19 years ago, I did a strategic analysis and realized, you know, the biotech industry has billions of dollars. I have a dollar ninety-five. They own Congress, but their weak point is the consumer concern for the health dangers, and that's what they confirmed also in Europe when the eruption of the concern came out. Uh, Burson Marsteller, who's their PR firm, uh, you know, for for all these nasty chemical producers, mm -hmm. said, you know. The concern is going to be about health and about long-term environmental problems, and don't engage in debates, etc. Right, right, right. Okay, so that's why we're in touch with Ronnie Cummins, for example. He was saying uh, in a release this morning that Monsanto's activity now with the Senate is uh, educating them in quotes that this will actually provide fair and accurate labeling for all the food and end the whole issue in a positive manner. And he's saying, he's suggesting that some of the senators may actually believe that, which I found hard to imagine. Well, you know, I've, I've spoken to politicians around the world, and um, a lot of them are just, you know, when you hear the same thing from many people, um, they, you know, the biotech industry does a lot of underhanded stuff. They were contacting people who are pro-GMO labeling and saying, call your, call your senator or call your congressman, to tell them to pass it because it'll give us labeling. Yeah. You know, so the people yeah. were contacting them for the wrong information. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So the the people in the Senate are not necessarily real experts on this subject. They're just noticing what impressive authorities tell them which yeah. pieces of information. Yeah. Okay. All right. So basically, the the most important thing, besides if possible, not getting this bill passed, is that everybody needs to be very educated and take the time to read labels and not buy GMO. Right? And I also think people, you know, people listening to this show should not only do it for themselves, but they should do it for others. Um, up to this point, the most effective tool for convincing someone to avoid GMOs has been the movie Genetic Roulette, which is available at geneticroulettemovie.com. The movie that we think will be even more powerful is Secret Ingredients, which is available which is available to donate to at secretingredientsmovie.com. Genetic Roulette was seen by millions in every country, uh, played over 300 times on PBS. It was very, very effective, but it didn't have the personal side, the stories of individuals getting better. And this is what this particular movie has, and it's, so it's going to become a lot more viral, a lot more sticky, so to speak, a lot more effective. Right. And so um, that I think that you know when it comes to me in terms of my priorities – my priority is to create a massive consumer education campaign using the most effective tools that we know about to change people's diet so that using GMOs becomes a marketing liability for the food companies so they get rid of it. Yeah. And that's and that's already happening. 15% of Americans in 2007 said they were avoiding or reducing GMOs already. 40% said it last year. Even if not all that many people are doing what they're saying, it shows a, a swelling, a, a explosion of anti-GMO belief and associated, um, you know, desires. And this is where this is exactly where we're going to win ultimately. Right. Now, it occurred to me to ask you the question too. What happens if this sentiment against GMO spreads enough so that people even start demanding non-GMO corn and soy and things like that that are almost totally available at this point? Do they do the farms start uh, arising that that can turn that around even with those crops? Um, yeah, I mean absolutely. It just takes some some growing seasons to replace because you know you just grow out enough non-GMO seed and you just plant that. Right now, most of the Soy foods sold in the natural food industry are non-GMO, and you know there's 93 percent of the soy or corn, but there's still seven percent that are not. And most of the soy or corn is used as animal feed, and some are used as biofuel. So right. it's just a question of uh, once we tip the marketplace, the seed dealers are going to have to produce non-GMO seeds. So within a few growing seasons, it'll it'll reverse trend. Right. An another thing that came up for me was a question on um, people growing food organically. If they're going to use manure in their garden to help the soil, they have to check on what animals it came from, right, and what they were eating because Absolutely. the genetic material goes into the manure, I would assume, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, the chicken manure contains a lot of glyphosate in it. Right, right. Yeah, the glyphosate is the other thing. So um, it just needs the, the rising of another, a much stronger organic industry, it sounds like. 
just um, uh, producing the what's needed for the market. Well, to me, and, and and what happens is, if you go to the demand side, you'll be most effective. If you try and convince the supply side, you know, try and convince farmers to change their their habits, mm. and you're going against a huge disinformation campaign where most of their information comes from the biotech industry, the okay. seed dealers, the chemical dealers, the land grant universities, the extension agents, the farm journals, the Farm Bureau, etc. They're all basically funded or the biotech industry themselves. But if you go to the consumers and so that the, cons- the demand is for more non-GMO and organic and the premiums are higher, they're all, all the farmers are economists. They're always looking at future prices and stuff and they realize, oh my God, I can make two bucks more or five bucks more or three bucks more per bushel depending on whether it's non-GMO or organic, etc. Right. And that will that'll move the market uh, the easiest way just as long as we have enough non-GMO seed to go around. Yeah, exactly. So that, that'll be at a premium, and that will bring more people into the market producing it, I would think. Yes, definitely. And and how how are you planning on disseminating and promoting the new movie? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it, the last time I did Genetic Roulette, um, it was out just before Prop 37, which was the vote for labeling in California. So mm-hmm. I rushed the production and rushed it into distribution. We had a, a, a free showing week online, co-sponsored by Mercola.com and other groups. And we had 1.2 million views within a week. And then when we added, when we extended the few more weeks, we had more than 2 million views. Right. Uh, and then we got it through uh, PBS, and it's been played all over, and it's been rec- it's been translated and played on many um, international stations. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know exactly how we're going to do secret ingredients. We have some ideas, but uh, I can't share those ideas publicly because I know who else is listening. Okay, no problem. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I, I've seen some really interesting debates lately too on YouTube between. Uh, Monsanto representatives, and I think one of them actually was a, a girl about 15 years old. Are you familiar with that one? Rachel Parent. Um, I just was with her two weeks ago. Um, she's from Canada. Okay. Um, she has the, the Kids' Right to Know group there, and she started when she was 13. Wow. Wow. Yeah, she was really impressive. I think the uh, Monsanto representative asked her if she was really a lobbyist and what kind of uh, ulterior motives she actually was hiding. Yeah, actually, it was a it was a Canadian show host. I think I don't know if he was actually from Monsanto, um, but uh, he was one that had been convinced, and so uh, she actually won that discussion, won that debate. Yeah, exactly. And I guess they're still trying to tell people that this is the way to feed the world, right? That's why we need GMOs. Um, that's one of the th- yeah one of the things that they they're pretending. Yeah, and it turns out that almost there there are no advantages in the growing ability or the resistance to drought or um, the yield amounts or any that's all made up apparently right yeah the the yield is actually lower on average than the conventional and it also is less um, resilient to drought and bad weather right right um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is is Institute for Responsible Technology I think has a lot of different kinds of outreach programs going on you know at the same time including I think I saw something on your site related to kids learning about GMOs and things like that in the schools. Yeah, we, we um, there's plenty of stuff going on in our, both on our website and also on our Facebook page. Um, we don't have any curriculum yet for schools, but we've been told that there's some people that want to create curriculum and we're distribute it as soon as it's available. Mm-hmm. But we do have a lot of information that I've been helping to put together for close to 20 years. Um, that's on the site, and uh, and also we're going to be launching a new site momentarily uh, with a lot of new information. So we also have information about Roundup on there. So okay. I would, and then a new site coming on board about Roundup as well. Okay. I also wanted to know what's the current status, and and maybe just a little bit of background for people to understand something about like a character reference for the biotech industry in the sense that um, they have a history, I think, of letting uh, GMO seeds go on to non-GMO farms and then suing the farm for trying to steal the patented seeds. Is that is that right? And if so, what's going on with that right now? Well, yeah, they, they don't allow farmers to save seeds and replant it. So they've gone after seed cleaners. They've gone after farmers. Some of the farmers they went after 
um, never planted or never bought Monsanto seeds. It was just from cross contamination. Or uh, we've heard that some people from Monsanto, we've heard this, haven't verified it, actually throw their GMO seeds onto fields in order to create contamination. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we've also heard that they'll drop Roundup uh, from planes to see if the fields will, will withstand it. If they find one that withstands it that's not supposed to have it, they'll uh-huh. file a lawsuit. They'll go onto properties illegally. They use um, the Canadian Royal, retired Royal Canadian Mounted Police and and um, you know the uh, Pinkerton cops in the U.S. So they've they've sued or taken to court or settled for over 300 farmers and farm organizations for uh, hundreds of millions. It's been a disaster. Wow, is that still going on that they're suing people for having their seed even if they don't know it? Yeah. Wow. I I heard something about maybe it was in California or some other state that the state actually made it so that that would not keep happening in their local area. Yeah, this, they can't be sued for small presence. Um, some states have, have looked at that. Um, it's I don't know how much is going on right now. The Center for Food Safety did a nice report on it in the past. Um, I don't I haven't seen any more recent uh, evidence, but... What happens is when they settle with a farmer, they seal the documents. They make sure the farmer is basically blocked from making saying anything. Okay, that's one of the stipulations for the settlement is you can't talk. Exactly, about. exactly. Interesting. Um, now, the other thing I noticed is in your trailer, it, it you know, there's there's some major. We've been having some people on about some major causes of autism, and it sounds like. Uh, the GMOs are definitely something that can aggravate or cause neurological problems, including autism, because that was one of the things that the people said got better when they yeah, were Yeah, that was the case. I mean, in, that- in my first, my other film, Genetic Roulette, actually was my third film, um, there were three families that talked about when they went to a non-GMO organic diet, their kids got better from autism, either improved or actually, you know, dramatically improved. Mm-hmm. In this particular case, there's at least two kids that have um, no longer the the diagnosis, the classification is being autistic. Yeah. Um, we think that um, glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, may be a major contributor to the rising rates of autism. It's certainly not an exclusive contributor mm-hmm. because there was explosions before glyphosate was used um, a lot on, on crops and in the food supply. Yeah. But it, but it, there's a lot of um, biochemical reasons why glyphosate seems to be locking into that diagnosis the way it uh, chelates minerals and damages the mitochondria and locks certain pathways and is an antibiotic and kills beneficial good bacteria that might cause leaky gut and all these different things that are already part of the diagnosis and characteristic of these autistic children. Mm-hmm. So there's been, a, there's been a lot of, I mean, I've spoken to parents, you'll see it in the film, Secret Ingredients, where when they take an autistic child and they change the diet, a certain percentage of those children recover or get dramatically better. Right. Not all of them, a certain percentage. And so yeah. um, it's not a cure-all, and it's not something that's been proven in laboratories, but it's been certainly proven in, in people's lives yeah. to have that effect, but only in a certain percentage. Okay, all right. So, you know, the the recognition now being more widespread that glyphosate itself is a, a threat to life basically. Right. And I think, I think with a, as I, as we wrap up the, the interview, I think what I want to do is leave people on a positive note mm-hmm. and, and say this, certainly buy organic, whatever you can. In fact, I would suggest switching to a hundred percent organic diet yeah, that's where for, I was going. For, for a number of weeks and as a minimum, and during those time, during that time, take notes about your health, your sleep, your mood, your behavior. Not only yours, but if you do it with your family, the whole family. There's there's evidence suggesting that that you know when switching to organic, I've seen this over and over again with parents saying their kids no longer are acting out, they're no longer more violent, the kids are the school's not calling calling home and, and complaining. Some kids that were going to be kicked out of school are no longer in that position. Some kids who are having a lot of problems are now at the top of their class. Um, so many mood and behavior issues have changed as well as sleep patterns, um, 
as well as many, many chronic diseases. The number one category that we found in both surveys as well as um, in hand counts of more than 125 lectures is gastrointestinal. The next one is always energy, increased energy and reduced brain fog. Then you have asthma and allergies and skin conditions and joint pain and, and mental issues or behavioral or emotional issues like anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Um, all these things we've seen and massive numbers of people have shown improvement switching to an organic and non gmo diet. So we strongly recommend that people take notes for themselves and their family and when they switch to 100% organic and then see what their life is like eating real food. Okay. That's a good place to leave it. And um, I would certainly also add that everybody who's listening and everybody they can tell should go to the website secretingredientsmovie.com and uh, spread the awareness of that movie, make donations to it so it can happen sooner, and, um, you know, lead by example. Do exactly what Jeffrey just said and uh, see what happens to your family. It should be exciting. Thank you so much, and safe eating, everyone. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for being with us, Jeffrey. I hope we'll talk to you again soon.